sheet at the entrance uh, for tracking purposes in case there's a, an issue with COVID um, there. So please do that uh, on the way out. On Tuesday uh, next week, we will have our next lunchtime talk, who will be given by a uh, center follow uh, uh, Hengi Chan, who is uh, right there with us. On Friday uh, next uh, week, we will have the second annual lecture series talk. Uh, this uh, ALS talk will be online at noon, and not with, with online at noon from noon to 2 p.m., given by Sai Green. Uh, we, uh, if you're interested in that lecture, you should register online so that you can get an invitation for the talk. And you can go to the website of the center and just register on that. Uh, and we hope to see many of you for this uh, lecture. And today, it's really my uh, great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Heather de Glass, who is, uh, we're very lucky to have her for the whole year. She's a senior visiting fellow at uh, the uh, center. Many of you know, um, probably all of you know Heather quite well, so she really needs no introduction, but nonetheless, I'm going to introduce her. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, she has uh, a beautiful year, so she's in a way, uh, she's coming back on a regular, on a regular basis, but uh, uh, we're delighted to have her back for the whole year. She's currently a professor uh, in the Department of Philosophy at Michigan State University. After ha having been Waterloo Chair in Science and Society at uh, the University of Waterloo, where she has Canada very fondly in her heart. <laughs> what is the cold best of, of, of Canada, how it's called there. Uh, 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 Heza works uh, in a range of areas in the in philosophy of science. She's very well known and she's extremely well known for her. Uh, first uh, book, uh, Science Policy and the Value Free uh, 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 ideal, ideal, which is a, a classic in philosophy of science over the last 20 years. It's been an extremely successful, <laughs> very successful <laughs> book in philosophy of science, been cited dozens and hundreds of times. Uh, it has, in a sense, reshaped uh, to, to some extent the area of uh, debate around values in, in science. More recently, I think that's your second book, right? Uh, just published, and that's a gift. That is a... It's available <laughs> free. <laughs> <laughs> it's a right place of science, science values, and democracy. It's at the Descartes lecture. So that's a, her own lecture, followed by commentary and the head of stars. Um, that's her most recent. And I think she's been working on a, on a new book, right? Uh, on a new project around science policy and the intersection, because I think it's a great area of philosophy of science, and in a way, political science. Mm -hmm. That's so right. I think that's really a, an interesting uh, project, very topical, of course, and uh, quite interesting. But many things that have been happening over the last few years. Yes. <laughs> but today, uh, Heather's going to be looking at some things which might be related. We're thinking the social contract for sense. Merci beaucoup, Edouard. <laughs> um, yeah, so 12 years ago, I published my first book on uh, policy for science, but I punted on the question of, um, no, I, I, the, book, the book was on uh, science and policy, but I punted on the question of thinking about general policies for science because I thought it was too hard. And so now I have a year at the center and now I get to try to tackle this. So this is an introduction to trying to get my hands around the problem of how to think about policy for science. And as uh, we'll go through the talk today, um, I'll introduce the social contract. This has been the predominant way that policymakers have thought about the relationship between science and government, science and society since uh, the end of World War II. And as we'll see, it's, it's really problematic for like a whole host of reasons. And part of what I'm going to be trying to do this year is trying to figure out, well, how should we be thinking about it? Because I think doing without norms on this area is a huge mistake. Okay, so that didn't work. Damn it. <laughs> Help. It's a three. It, uh, should work now? Is it? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, okay. So the starting point for the talk is that science is not just an epistemic enterprise. Of course, it's an epistemic enterprise. Philosophers of science focus primarily on the epistemic aspects of science. But science is also deeply ethical, including not just internal practices of science, how you should do responsible research, how to deal with replication, how to deal with authorship issues and mentoring, but also how to deal with 
human and animal subjects, how to deal with the research agenda, whether some aspects of the research agenda should be off the table for ethical reasons, like the debate about gain of function research recently. And then there are political aspects to science, including the fact that it uses science funds, uh, tens of billions of dollars of US funds go to science every year in this country. So this is not an insubstantial aspect. In addition, science, of course, should be informing our political debates about what is in public good or public interest. And there might be very legitimate political restrictions on some scientific activities, like pursuing bioweapons is actually against a UN convention, and we're all quite happy about that. So science is not just an epistemic enterprise, it's ethical, it's political. And I think philosophy of science as a field should grapple with all of these normative aspects of science to really have a full-fledged philosophy of science. So I'm gonna try to show a little bit what this might look like today, or at least give some structures to start with. I think a lot of people are starting to move in this direction. And in April, um, I'll, we'll be hosting a workshop on institutions and the scientific research agenda, which will have a lot of discussions about political structures and institutions in science, institutions as um, what sociologists would call formal organizations rather than rules. So just to flag that that's what we mean. Okay, so the structure for today, I'm gonna to talk first about the social contract for science because this is the predominant theoretical or conceptual understanding of the relationship between science and society, at least broadly in science policy. Um, there was recently a celebration of the social contract for science because it was the 75th anniversary of Vannevar Bush's Endless Frontier monograph that kind of, everyone's like, oh, we need to think about this and keep it going. Um, the US is very central in the story. Um, that's partly because of the historical contingencies coming out of World War II that the US was really the, the only place that could really pursue robust science policy after World War II because it didn't have to rebuild its basic infrastructure. It hadn't suffered massive aerial bombing campaigns. All right, so the concepts that come out of the US actually end up dominating science policy discussions around the world because the US sort of has a 15 to 20 year head start on having these discussions. And I'm going to argue that there are particular conceptual parts to the social contract um, that really sort of make it seem obvious and binding. And uh, like, this is obviously how we should think about it. But it doesn't take long for challenges to the social contract as a conception to uh, be put forth, starting as early as the 1960s, but it sort of ends up not being a full fledged we need to redo the whole thing and rethink the whole thing until the 21st century. And I'll talk about why that's the case as we go through the challenge of the social contract. And then the last part of the talk, I'll argue that we need to jettison the whole idea of a social contract for good philosophical reasons, but then what should we replace it with? And uh, I'll try to think through some of the norms for science advising and science funding. Science advising is a little more well developed. I'm just investigating science funding right now, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what we should think. But let's go back and talk about the social contract for science and where it came from. All right. So prior to World War II, and the period when Daniel Greenberg talks about science being an orphan, um, this is a, a period where most scientists are working in academia and private labs. There is no federal funding for science generally except for the few scientists who are actually are employed by the government to do particular tasks, like work for the public health service or work on the census or the ge geological survey. Even when World War I really sort of ramped up particular institutions, so it's in World War I that you have the National Research Council being created by the National Academy of Sciences. And it was created to compete with the Naval Consulting Board, which was a bunch of engineers and inventors. And the scientists were like, where are we in the conversation? We have to do something. And so they competed on who would get to uh, detection of submarines through sonar first. It was a draw, turned out. So uh, they both got there about the same time. Um, but those efforts, the National Research Council sort of 
became quiescent after World War I. And so the institutions that were brought on board in World War I really didn't carry forward. The one thing that happens in this period that's perhaps interesting for a story is the first national lab is created. And this is a picture of the Langley Wind Tunnel, uh, the National Aeronautics, National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, NACA, um, was one of the, founded one of the first national labs. Um, it becomes NASA after in 1958 or nine. Um, so that's where that's going. But this was the first time that the federal research began to do something called contract research grants, where a scientist could apply and they could get money from the federal government to do a bit of research. If you were not doing aeronautics research in this period and you needed money, like for the first cyclotron, you'd go to the Rockefeller Foundation. Like private philanthropy was your main source of funding. So there's no general grant support for scientists and there are very weak advisory mechanisms in this period. World War II, of course, changes everything. And not just because of the atomic bomb, which of course ended World War II, perhaps even more important were things like the proximity fuse, which enabled much increased destructiveness of everything from aerial bombardment to mines for submarines. And DDT saved lots of lives. I know it's hard to hear that uh, in this day and age, but you know, fighting typhus, when you can't change your clothes, you wanna be dusted with DDT to make sure you don't pick up body lice. And penicillin, of course, became a massive tool for the military, even though it wasn't widely available for the populace, for really enabling people to survive um, just what would be, you know, now be considered a minor wound. Okay, so science does a lot and everyone's really feeling that in World War II. So then there's this debate. It starts actually in the middle of World War II, 1943 or so, once the tide's really turning, what should happen after World War II? And here are three different positions. The first is by J.D. Bernal, and Senator Harley Kilgore, folks like that, they argued that public funding of science should definitely occur, but those funds should be geared towards science that's going to aim at public good. And that's really what you need. Industry will fund what it needs, and government needs to fund the things that actually will benefit the populace generally. And the way to do that is to have scientists work with public officials Graphically, no, best men should be getting the funds. And of course we meant men at the time. Um, and it was a free play of free intellects that should decide what should get funded. That means scientists are deciding what should get funded because there's no point in asking the public. The public has no idea what is of interest to scientists, what's possible with scientists. And it's this sort of research that will eventually produce public good. All right, so if you just put the money into the basic science, that industry doesn't really have time, doesn't have a short-term payoff, that's what you need to do. And you let scientists decide where that money's to go all by themselves. The third model, uh, Jewett, Frank Jewett argued that the public funding of science would dilute the quality of American science. We shouldn't have public funding of science. He thought we should go back to the pre-World War II model of if you want a cyclotron, you go to the Rockefeller Institute. If you have a need, philanthropy will serve things because all, the only first-class fundamental science is worth supporting and needs so little money, it doesn't need public funding. And uh, having lots of public funding would actually make American science work. But as Daniel Greenberg notes, he's a minority one. No one thinks this is the right thing to do except do it at the end of World War II. Of course, Polanyi, the Polanyi Bridgman Bush vision is the one that wins. It wins in the sort of conceptual debate. This is how uh, we ended up thinking about the justification for public funding of science coming out of World War II. 
And this is the linear model for science funding. So the green is the money, right? And that goes into the realm of basic peer research where scientists decide what to do with it. Out of that will come science, scientific truths, scientific facts, which then can be applied. And for the developed, this can be funded by industry, doesn't need public funding for that. And from that will come social good, primarily in the form of consumer goods, medical breakthroughs and med um, military security. So Vannevar Bush argued um, in his 1945 monograph. Now, if you're thinking, I think there are other social goods that should be involved. Vannevar Bush was willing to dictate what the social good should be as a Zineb Pamuk's recent article so eloquently argued. Okay, so we have the linear model. This is dependent on this ideal of basic research. The idea is that basic research is essential for applied research. In fact, you have things that Vannevar Bush says, like, you know, only through coming up with basic research will you get technological applications. It's only through doing basic research that you come up with new things. So, um, and only scientists know which basic research is worth pursuing. No point in talking to the public about this. Um, and it's also unpredictable, right? It's serendipitous. So you never know where it's gonna lead, right? So um, you should not have any accountability measures for that research because of that serendipity. Further, a researcher who's pursuing basic research has in this period sort of maximum scientific freedom. You should just pursue knowledge, pursue inquiry, wherever it goes, and you should not have bear any responsibility for the societal impacts. That's sort of built into the conception of basic research for both Michael Polanyi and Percy Bridgman that was central. The whole Society for Freedom in Science was set up around this idea at the time. All right, so scientific freedom in the 20th century is this particular conception. So scientific freedom, of course, included freedom from state interference or meddling, which is really important. The International Council of Scientific Union actually spends a lot of time protecting scientists from state meddling uh, starting in the 1960s. Um, there's also the freedom to decide what is worth pursuing solely in terms of scientific potential. And it was just to be decided internal to discipline and sort of like a very Poonian paradigm kind of thing. It's only scientists doing this work, separated from society that makes any sense. And further, this is also freedom from societal responsibility. So Bridgman's 1947 essay was quite powerful on this point. So any ultimate impacts of research for basic research, you're just not responsible for. That's not your job as a scientist. You are just to pursue truth. That's all you're supposed to do. It was researchers who were in that second part, the applied research, those working institutions that were particularly aiming at particular goals, particular practical goals. They were both constrained in their freedom by the institution and responsible for the research. So the more freedom you had, the less responsibility and the less freedom, the more responsibility. Um, these three parts together I think comprise the core set of ideas in the social contract for science. The idea of basic as distinct from applied research, the idea of freedom from responsibility if you're pursuing basic research and the linear model for science funding which justifies public funds for basic research. Now, if you have this conception of how and why to fund science and to pursue science in society, you have some further implications that just fall out of that. Basic science takes place in an isolated separate sphere from society because there are no societal implications and you're not supposed to think about society when you're doing it. You're just supposed to be pursuing truth. Right? It's off in its own realm. This obviously means that good science is value-free. Um, when I was doing research for my first book, I went looking for defenses of the value-free ideal for science in science policy literature and I couldn't find it in this period. And now I know why. It's just a corollary. It falls out from the conception of basic research is taking place someplace outside of societal concerns. Science advice was ideally independent, coming from this separate sphere, dumping facts into the public realm. All right, and that was the best science advice you could have. If the public rejected science, that was just due to the public ignorance of what scientific facts. This is the deficit model of science communication. 
And science literacy, of course, was going to be crucial for public acceptance of science, because they need to know the facts in order to accept science. And so we had to have science education focused around training people for scientific facts. It's in the period of you know, the Sputnik realm, point around Sputnik, that you begin having assessments of public scientific literacy um, and the relationship between public rejection and science literacy becomes enshrined in sort of empirical as well as it is empirically confirmed, although we'll see there are problems, as well as sort of conceptualized this way. Okay, so you have this image of science, there's basic science, publicly funded, value-free, dumping into this nice, colorful, messy society. This is like my picture of colorful, messy society, <laughs> where you have applied science that use and independent science advice facts, right? That's the, that's the image of what's going on when you're doing science. All right. It's really hard to give a talk with a mask on. I'm discovering it's thirsty. All right, so it doesn't take long for challenges to this idea to come about. Um, I'm not gonna do it chronologically. I probably should in a book, but we'll try to do it conceptually structured here today. Um, so the first thing you might say is, is this distinction between basic and applied research even cogent? And a lot of people argue that no, in fact, it's just politically convenient. It's just an argument for funding to do what you want. Um, as opposed to something that's really robust. Um, I argued something like that in a paper in 2014. Roger Pilkey sort of said things like that. Philip Kitcher has cast out on this. So there's a lot of people sort of worrying about whether or not there's a cogent distinction there. Um, a lot of STS scholars have, and historians have said, no, actually there's really no, nothing really robust to be said here. But Niels Rolf Hodgson did us the favor in 2017 of arguing for the distinction. He's like, no, no, no. All you historians and philosophers have it wrong. There really is a real distinction between basic and applied research. And what he argues in this paper is that there are different kinds of knowledge between basic and applied, different criteria for success, different social roles and effects, different institutions, that in fact, they function very differently. In his view, basic research seeks general knowledge of the world. Its role is theoretical to improve our understanding. It has no specific purpose outside of this. So that's really important. Now, one thing you might notice is that he's like basic research seeks. And you might wonder whether research itself seeks to do anything separate from the researchers conducting the research. He says that partly because he wants to get out of the idea that basic versus applied science is a matter of researchers' intentions. But yet intentionality sort of gets smuggled back in by this sort of metaphorical locution about research seeking something irrespective of intentions or irrespective of researchers. Now, one of the problems with uh, relocating intentions with researchers is um, if you think you're only responsible for what you intend, this is great, right? You can just intend to pursue truth and any societal implications are not yours to worry about, which is precisely the model of scientific freedom that was operating in this time. But intention doesn't bound responsibility generally because it's possible to be irresponsible due to recklessness, due to negligence. This is standard in human conceptions of responsibility, which means this isn't a correct sort of interpretation of what bounds responsibility. Now, we also have the presumption built into this kind of analysis that applied research does not improve our understanding, that it's basic research that improves our understanding. And we have a wealth of examples that show that this is simply wrong. Applied research, of course, improves our understanding about all kinds of things, and sometimes ramifies back up really interestingly onto theoretical conceptions. Um, there's a presumption that applied research is only patron specific because of its uh, affects what, what he calls the criteria of success and in institutional location, that applied research is just for solving patron specific problems. But that can't possibly be you know, capturing what we actually do when sometimes we try to do anything like an application of knowledge. And then there's the presumption that basic research does not have broader specific purposes addressing practical problems, which um, you can look at take climate change research, climate change research, Climate research clearly is seeking general knowledge of the world. 
and seeks to improve our understanding of things. Um, but it does have very specific purposes outside of just seeking to improve our understanding. And there are multiple examples of this kind of thing that just the basic applied conceptualization and division doesn't actually describe properly what research is about. This is a concern that goes back to John Dewey, who argued that the distinction between pure and applied research was specious, that all research was both theoretical and applied, properly done, and that there isn't a difference in kind at all. Yet, as Roel Hansen points out in this essay, a lot of science policy still hinges on a distinction between basic versus applied research. So the OECD collects statistics based on whether you're doing basic versus applied research. And most countries comply in that distinction. A few don't, like Scandinavian countries are like, nope, we don't think this works anymore. Hmm. Um, there are responsibility policies. For example, Germany, German's constitution enshrines a freedom from responsibility if you're doing basic research. So there are still policies that have this sort of conceptualization stuck in them. Then there are problems with the linear model. Um, these uh, worries about the linear model actually started in the 1960s and further ramped up in the 1970s when Congress began asking for all these billions of dollars, are we actually getting the goods that Vannevar Bush promised us? These questions began to arise. So much so that by 1980, uh, Congress decided to sort of nudge the pipeline a bit by making it legal to patent research that was uh, produced by public funds which is the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, to try to get scientists to move beyond their hermetically, sphere, hermetically sealed sphere of research and incentivize them to push things to market more effectively. Um, and the fact that so many universities have commercial transfer offices is a testament to the success of the Bayh-Dole Act in this, in this aspect. Um, there are also worries about conservatism of scientific communities that, um, you know, organizations like the NIH don't pursue the best research as a paper by Anna Anides and oh, this is co-author from 2012 in Nature suggested, um, or examples where, um, you know, and the NIH actually declined to fund breast cancer vaccine research. It was DARPA that ended up funding it. It's now in clinical trials. Um, what's going on? Why aren't we pursuing this sort of really, um, innovative and exciting research. Why is it that our research institutions that are supposed to be funding basic fundamental science are actually sort of not pursuing the most exciting ideas? Um, and then there are just alternative accounts. So almost nobody believes that the linear model is descriptively true even most of the time anymore. There's too many feedback loops. Um, there are plenty of examples of directed or applied research that has led to big theoretical breakthroughs. So DOD supported transistor research, which led to computers. Now you have entire fields of computer science. So you might say computer science is all applied research, but I think a lot of computer scientists are like, no, there's some basic research there too. Or the classic example of Penzias and Wilson at Bell Labs, who were trying to scrub out sources of noise and end up discovering the microwave background radiation. All right, so there are these many examples where it just, Applied research can lead to big breakthroughs. Um, applied research technology can actually be central to scientific pursuits of theoretical breakthroughs. I mean, think of all the technology that CERN needs to work. Um, and so one of the things that happens by the 1990s is you start having discussions of alternative topographies of scientific research. So for example, Gibbons argues that we've had disciplinary research there's some interdisciplinary research, but what we really need is transdisciplinary research where you work with outside partners to pursue questions of interest to get particular projects done. And uh, you know, more recently with Krimsky's book, Science and the Private Interest, he talks about public interest science that's quite distinct from private interest or commercial research or military research or regulatory science or academic science. Now we have lots of different possibilities and these can't possibly be put in any kind of pipeline or linear model of relationship. Finally, there was a big shift around the ideas of freedom and responsibility. So for the 20th century, most of the time, 
you still have this conception of freedom, scientific freedom includes freedom from responsibility. And this is even in the 1975 Edsel report, scientific freedom and responsibility. You think, oh, okay, now we're gonna overturn this, right? No. In that report, they again say basic research, no societal responsibility, applied research, lots of societal responsibility. They still hold to that distinction. But it's really in the 21st century, as concerns about dual use research arise and realizing that dual use research could show up anywhere at any time in any science, you could end up doing something that might help produce a new, um, you know, cyber weapon or a new bioweapon or a new explosive weapon or a better way to separate isotopes, fissile isotopes all over the place that um, scientists began to, well, the first they tried to circumscribe those to particular topics by doing things like creating select agent lists, but that didn't work. Counterexamples kept popping up all over the place. So that by the end of the first decade of the 21st century, on being a scientist had been revised. The first two editions, the first edition said there are no societal responsibilities generally. The second edition said, maybe you should communicate your results to the public if they ask. The third edition says, the standards of science extend beyond responsibilities that are internal to the scientific community. Researchers also have a responsibility to reflect on how their work and the knowledge they are generating might be used in the broader society. This is made even stronger in the AAAS statement on scientific freedom responsibility from 2017, where it says explicitly with freedom comes with responsibility. The more freedom you have, the more responsibility you have. And the same thing is also found in the World Economic Forum Young Code of Scientists on ethics in 2018. So this finally flipped um, in its valence. And then, right, there's the empirical inadequacy, inaccuracy of the deficit model, Brian Wynn's 1990 work from Cumbrian sheep farmers is great stuff on this point. But then Dan Kahan and other workers found that um, the more scientific literate in terms of being able to correctly identify scientific facts were, the more likely someone was to question what scientists were saying. So it was the exact opposite of what the deficit model would predict. And then the, uh, this is just some of the literature on rejecting the value-free idea. So just some of it. I'm not going to talk about that. You can, we can talk about that some other time. Okay. So this means like the uh, social contract is uh, under a lot of strain conceptually and normatively and descriptively. Now, there have been lots of calls over the past few decades. Jerry Rabbits called for a new social contract for science in 1988. Michael Gibbons, science's new social contract, 1994. David Augustine actually argued for retiring the social contract 20 years ago. I don't think they took him up on it. Um, more recently, 2019, this is from Canada, uh, right? Renewing the social contract for science innovation. Some lovely people up there are working on trying to think about this. So we keep calling for like, let's renew the contract. Let's renegotiate the contract. I wanna ask, why are we talking about a contract? Does this make any sense? If a contract is ideally between two parties, each able to autonomously agree to the terms, this doesn't make any sense for the functioning of science because science takes place within society. It's not some autonomous thing. If society were gone tomorrow, so would science, it would be done. So how should we think about this? If science takes place within and is dependent upon society and it's dependent for funding for the recruitment of scientists, I mean, scientists come out of society. Increasingly, we're working on having scientists reflect the appropriate diversity of society for the uptake of ideas, for inspiration, for problems. But it's also a distinctive activity. It has crucial central epistemic aims and some norms are quite distinctive for scientific communities. One of my favorite are norms for criticism within science. The general public doesn't, <laughs> when criticism is raised in the general public, you don't have an obligation to actually respond to everything. <laughs> you can ignore a lot of it. But when criticism is raised in the scientific community, someone's supposed to pick it up and say something, either rebut it, absorb it, incorporate it. That's part of the rules of the game. I'm central to the epistemic aims of science. All right, so 
here's what it might look like, <laughs> right? There's science now within messy, complicated, colorful society. I tried to figure out something that would give it some structure inside. It's got some structures inside of it. Um, what norm, but it's got a membrane around it that makes it somewhat distinctive, but it's also permeable. So this ends up sounding much more biological. Um, so what norm should govern the permeability of the membrane around science? What should pass through readily? Under what condition? What needs to be kept out? How do we keep, for example, the state from interfering with science in problematic ways? What are the essential structures needed within science for the pursuit of science, and how do we protect those? So we need norms to structure the science-society relationship. We need to know um, how science should be funded and why it should be funded. Um, I think the ideas of funding basic research is no longer adequate as an ideal. It was never what we did in practice. I'll show you some data on that soon. Um, how should ethical responsibility, accountability, and oversight, notice I don't think responsibility and accountability are the same thing, and oversight is something else in addition. How should that work? How do we, we talked about this last night at dinner, how should we ensure the structures actually engender responsible science without overburdening with regulatory systems, especially as there's no responsibility-free zone in science anymore? And what norms should structure science advising? If science is no longer independent somehow, how should we protect the space of scientific inquiry from political interference? And what counts as political interference? And how should, what should we aim for with public engagement with science? What's possible? What are the ideals? How should the public and can the public be involved productively to produce the kind of science we need? Now, I have time. I have like 10 more minutes, don't I? Oh. And actually talk through some examples. So what I'm going to, I'm not, obviously I can't answer all those questions. Those are really hard questions, but I'm going to try to sketch what it might look like to begin this by um, talking about science advising and then science funding. So a lot of times when people talk about science advice, they still use the trope of independence. So at the International Network for Government Science Advisors meeting in last month, they had a workshop in independence and science advice. How do we keep independence going. When the Union of Concerned Scientists, you know, this is a, was looking at the science advisory board shift. This is a really disturbing shift from 79% university to 47% university. Can everyone see this? And then industry and consulting are really expanding, right? And they're worried about independence. And this is because with the old ideal, you wanted independent science advisors. This is articulated in a Don Price's classic 1965 book, The Scientific Estate, where he talks about a spectrum from truth to power. Scientists are over here in the value-free, responsibility-free, truth-seekers, independent from society kind of thing. And it's that independence that allows them to speak truth to power over here, where there's value-laden, full responsibility, power-seekers, right? But this independent, we might ask independent from what? What are we talking about? Because even the university scientists, are not, they're not independent. They get grant money, they have publications, they work at universities. This isn't independence. They're not like, you know, Shapin's independently wealthy gentlemen, right? This, we're far from that sort of situation. So what does independence mean? It seems like it's a way to talk about conflict of interest but doesn't get at responsibilities that science advisors have. So in a recent paper, I argued that we needed a different model for what counted as good science advice. The good science advice, the science advisor is strung up. And this is why science advising is really hard because you have three lines of obligation that you cannot trade off against each other. You have an obligation to the scientific community to represent what is known by scientists accurately. You have an obligation to your advisee to communicate to them, but also to do so in line with the things that they care about in ways that are empirically accurate. That's really challenging. And if the advisee tries to abuse your advice as cover for a decision that your advice actually isn't in line with, you have to go public and tell the public that this is what's happening. Further, most science advice should also be made public as much as possible. 
If you talk to science advisors in practice, they say their job is really hard. They're always negotiating among these different systems. And that's because they have these lines of obligation. This is not independence, but you can see that um, you're still gonna get the sort of accurate empirical accuracy that we care about because this line of obligation has to be met. Okay. So that's a very different model than independence. It's almost like the drawing and quartering of science advisors, though you don't actually wanna do that in practice. All right, what about science funding? What should the public fund and why? The linear model's wrong. What are we doing with science funding? Um, and I wanna just plug Zanette Pamuk's recent 2018 article on justifying public funding for science. It's a really lovely article that has helped me think about this. Um, we need to think about what the right categories are of research once we move beyond basic first applied science. These are just some. Um, and how should we further evaluate science funding systems? This is not something we've done a good job of. Most evaluation of science funding systems at most looks at things like citations, but that's not societal impact. And yet we have 70, 80 years of data of science grants and potential societal impacts. There is a tremendous wealth of opportunity here to actually study which mechanisms of funding work best for the public good. I suspect, you know, we might find it doesn't matter, it's all a wash. That would be super interesting if we actually discovered that. Um, but there might be some that actually are more productive for public good, and maybe those should be more prioritized. And then maybe also, you know, there's been a lot of debate about lottery systems and how they break down particular concerns about conservatism in science and enabling transformative research to have a better chance and also making the funding application process less horrific, um, going over and over again and getting ridiculous comments back. Um, so there are, uh, you know, lots of things that we could study, but we haven't, which is really interesting in itself. I think that speaks to the power that the social contract has had, but this hasn't been an area of study, for example, for meta science. And I talked to James Wilson at the Research on Research Institute, and he's like, nope, we haven't done that yet. We're looking at replication, we're looking at citation, we're not looking at societal impact, we're not going that extra bit. Now, reality check, this is what US science funding looked like from 1953 to 2017. This is in billions of dollars, levelized without inflation. So this is the lovely growth. Um, you can see the, this is um, federal funding here. The red is industry funding. So by the early 1990s, industry funding was outstripping public funding of science um, and continues to do so by a large magnitude. The US is not alone in this. This is typical for all OECD countries. In the last 20 years now, industry funding has outstripped public funding. And this suggests minimally that public funding for commercial interest science is like the, a, a bad investment because industries got plenty of skin in the game there. Even though people seem to still argue that that's what we have to do to like fight China or something. Um, just federal R&D, so unfortunately I don't, can't go back to 1953 because I couldn't find good data on that. Um, 1976 to 2020, the big source is of course DOD. The next is NIH, then DOE, then NASA, and this little gray, dark gray, that's NSF, all right? So focusing on NSF is not gonna give you an accurate picture of, of the American science funding system. Um, this is a lot of money. This is again, uh, constant billions of dollars for fiscal year 2020. So this is like taking care of inflation. 80 billion in 1976, 160 billion in 2020. So what's the public getting for this investment? Well, we're living longer, 1900 to 2020, life expectancy is going up all over the world. Um, it's kind of leveled off in the US recently. That might be a worry. Uh, US uh, 
gross domestic product per capita in constant $12 from 1930 to 2020, 10,000 to just under 60,000, right? So that's constant dollars. We're getting wealthier, we're living longer. However, we also have growing inequality. So you can see like the, the bottom uh, half is losing wealth as the top sectors grow. Or here's the Gini coefficient. The higher you are, the less, the more inequality you have. And it's growing. And it's been growing while we've been funding a lot of science. So depends on what you look at. It looks like there's societal benefit from this or not. This is very crude scale. And you might say to me, Heather, of course, correlation is not causation. And I would say, yeah, that's right. So maybe we shouldn't be looking at any of this. Maybe we need much more fine grained, particular health outcomes, particular societal benefits, particular environmental quality measures, particular access to goods and services measures. But this is where a systematic study is lacking. We have lots of anecdotes, we have lots of stories, we have lots of examples. But I don't know, if, I know one study coming out of Germany on sustainability research looking at two different research systems. That was published about four years ago. That's it. This is sort of shocking that we don't know more about how public funding of science leads to public good. That what we have are stories when there's so much data available. And as the Nobel Prize in economics went to people working on natural experiments, we could be doing natural experiments in this area. Not me, I don't know how to do natural experiments, but I'd be happy to partner with people who do because we have decades of data and different grant systems like NSF's or NIH's basic research versus DARPA's problem-oriented research. We have different topic areas. There are different countries. You could look at different national systems. Um, you could allow for a time lag for impacts to play out. Like we could look at nothing past 2000 just to give things a chance to have an impact. Um, I think there's a lot of possibility for good social science here that is not yet done. And I think we're gonna to need to do that to figure out what the social relationship between science studies should actually be if the social contract is not gonna work. Oh dear. Okay, conclusions. <laughs> um, so I think the social contract for science is inapt and unhelpful as a metaphor, as a description, it's pretty inaccurate, even as an ideal, it doesn't help us understand what we need to understand about this. If science is in, not independent from society, but embedded within it, we have to ask what the relationship between science and society should be. And we're gonna need norms to both protect the epistemic aims and epistemic functioning of science, but also to ensure responsible and responsive science. Um, and I think that foster science are gonna be essential to this discussion, because I think Foster of science have a really good grasp on the importance of this, and we need to get better at thinking about this. Thank you. We take a two minute break as we are over two minutes for students to leave, and then we'll have time for questions. I gotta hear my mask out. Oh. Oh, that's so hot. <laughs> I'm going to just breathe in here for a little bit. No, <sighs> Okay, repeat the questions. Exactly. All right. <laughs> Can I move this over a little bit? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> I <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Let's talk later. All right, let's get started. Match of the first one. So I'm supposed to repeat these things for the mic because so um I, and I'm going <laughs> to so uh first of all he's off he's actually started Mike Dietrich has already started a project on neglected tropical diseases and funding and so I get to, to actually see some data about the societal impact of funding thank you this is partly what I wanted was like help from people who are actually doing this work um I think your point about extending the frame back to the 19th century to look at things like the Merrill Act and the founding of land grant universities. Um, of course, MSU is one. We're very proud of our extension um, program. I think that that's right, that in some sense, that kind of research uh, is the, the baseline, the, the sort of normal. Um, and so that that I don't want to think of it as just applied research, though, right? It's, it's research um, and it's agriculture research. It's, it's locally embedded agriculture research. Um, Katie Kendig and Julia Burstein have a project actually on that right now, which I'm super excited about. Um, and so uh, the idea that somehow there's this linear model applied, you know, basic applied distinction is an artifact of the late 19th century, I mean, the, the plea for pure science, the first ones came out in 1880, right after this kind of, of shift, and um, really sort of shaped a lot of the discussions around what the value of science was, first primarily in education, like, right? And, and then it ended up being about hierarchies between scientists and engineers, right? Which, professionalization of science yeah right keeping the public keeping the riffraff out which included uh <laughs> women and so forth um yeah so a lot of these structures sort of are inherently elitist and one of the things i like about Zineb Pamuk's article so much is she points out that even the goals that like that bush lays out in the endless frontier are elitist because he's deciding what is in the public interest and he's not an elected official at all 
right? He's saying these are the things that we should be aiming for with science. The obsession with new technologies, with military superiority, um, carries through most of the 20th century. And that's a problem, right? So, yes. All right. So we have for your information, eight people and 20 oh. oh, boy. So, uh, <laughs> rather than next, try to just make it to the point. Okay. These are serious. I have three things to say. <laughs> <laughs> Which was partial. I don't pretend that's complete. Those yeah. are just the ones that like I thought of. Yeah. So here's just a couple questions like the mm -hmm. one, which is who should be in the conversation in designing those norms for shining, right? Because in my mind it should be, you know, like additional stakeholders. And so mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, how do we get them involved in this, you know, conversation to make sure that they're not it's not in this like primary power of like figure out what Right, that's yeah. right. Right, it has to be a big conversation. Yeah, so this uh, yeah. yeah. Question. And then um, a second suggestion is about the question about um, how should science be funded? And in particular, you know, how do we align models for funding with models of social impact? So it just kind of reminds me of things that are happening in the private sector. And I was wondering whether they might be helpful as models. So I was thinking about the, you know, impact investing movement. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of what they do is they say, okay, like in the old days, which is actually the present, um, you have VCs like venture capital only wanting to fund things that are making money. But today, some of them are like, hey, let's not, like, not destroy the world. Maybe let's help. Maybe you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, standards that you're using and methodologies. And I, I wonder, yeah. it is like models for funding at the end of the day. So I, I wonder if some of it could be inspiration for funding for science. Absolutely. I mean, it's certainly something to look at, especially measures of impact, exactly. right? Which as a philosopher, you sort of think, oh, no, I don't know how to measure societal impact. But social scientists have all kinds of measures yeah. of societal impact. Yeah. So I thought we should ask them. Yeah, and there are what? actually all kinds of measures already that have been developed for like their research. So right. I'm like, yeah, this is a place to look at specifically. And then the third question, which is um, somewhat tangential, but I kind of wonder what you think about this. You know, it's kind of like, oh, yeah. I wonder how you see philosophy in this field. So mm. you talk about social contracts for science, and I know it sounds like you're thinking, you know, traditional, quote unquote, kind of thing, physics and biology. But in my mind, I'm also thinking about humanities and specifically our own discipline. Yeah. So I think we should rethink our own contract. Uh, and I wonder. What contract? We don't cost anything. Funding is really important because yeah. helping, you know, in different directions, but we philosophy and other humanities, we don't rely on grants as much. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you don't have responsibility. Yeah. So, and so I wonder, so that's a point of differences. It makes me think, yeah, how do we like expand the model maybe to also think about humanities? You know? Yeah, so I mean, humanities is a form of inquiry yeah. done well. And so if you move from scientific research to inquiry, you might end up broadening this is going to have a bit of a different shape yeah. because of different um, university instruction models and different um, funding models that we already have. Yeah. You're right, we don't rely upon, we don't, we don't bring graduate students in on a grant to do particular things, which is just allows for more freedom of exploration of topics for our graduate students, which is a good thing. Nuance of like freedom comes with responsibility. That is a norm that I do not really think as much as I think it could be really mm -hmm. within philosophy, regardless of where the money is coming from. Yeah. I mean, if you're actually doing philosophy that actually has an impact on societal norms, there are responsibilities there. And I would be happy to talk with anyone who's interested in doing that kind of work on how to navigate that, because it is interesting. Right? Yes. Okay, so yes, we come from different perspectives. Yes. 
I wonder if you worry where, where, where a little bit about the complete rejection of the basic science that it's like that. I mean, I totally take the point that I can't remember the in time. But we know that scientists think things in our in time. And it seems like, you know, it's on the one hand, I think they're like very small stuff. Yes, LIGO, lovely. And at the other extreme, I, 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 I look at trying to find a vaccine for patients. <laughs> it feels like there's an important structural difference in what's going on there in terms of society impact and relevance. So, so I'm wondering what is the structural difference? I mean, if you look at the researchers who are developing mRNA vaccines 20 years ago, they just won the Golden Goose Award from AAAS. They were trying to develop a new platform for a vaccine, right? There was a lot of lack of financial support because vaccine, people who were sending vaccines are like, why bother with another platform? Don't we have one that's good? Um, so there's pushback there. It's going to take resources. There were roadblocks. There was serendipity. There was... And, you know, like it's smaller science. LIGO is a big, a big project requiring two large, very finely calibrated instruments on different parts of the country, which is fantastic. Um, but um, structurally, what? what? So, so, so I think I, I, I don't mean the long research project that eventually made the vaccine. I mean, the actual research project was something that started 18 months ago. Oh, right. OK. I mean, <clears throat> That, that research is very clearly carried out by a very limited society of theory on mm -hmm. a manageable time scale that includes the public. Yes. It, it's debatable if you could depend like on that kind of society in the But if you were, it would be the kind of basic physics defense that says that in the, in the fullness of time, it's going to be the Well, I mean, okay, so one of the things that I think scientists who are doing the kind of research that LIGO is doing should stop doing is saying things like someday we will have technology that enables to manipulate or use gravitational waves uh, i'm not even sure that would be a good idea uh, much less something that we actually want so some science funding is about understanding the world and wonder and curiosity this is why we dig up dinosaurs, as far as I can tell, which people love. <laughs> you know, it's not because we need to like discover a larger dinosaur, which we keep doing someplace, but because it's cool. Now, you might say, okay, there's all kinds of things that are cool. And this has been one of the problems for people pursuing research that, you know, is mostly, I think there's, you know, curiosity driven research just blue sky you could have a word for it don't put it in the linear model don't think it absolves responsibility perfectly fine but then how much funding should it get compared to art for example or humanities if it's just for us understanding and exploring our world and having a better understanding of our role in it lots of things suddenly end up in the same pot as modes of inquiry this is super uncomfortable for scientists. I mean, there's lots of sensible distinction between LIGO and, for instance, theoretical research on superconductivity or electromagnetism or quantum theory of relativity. I mean, there's lots of things where this is completely impossible to do with the without total completion. But obviously, those things have been economically, societally, performative. Okay. You can, we can talk about the history of the development of the transistors. That was one of the things that the Department of Defense funded to produce, you know, solid state. Oh, right. so, okay, yeah. So, but there, you know, um, that there might be some big societal benefit. You could say like, well, art has big societal benefit too, right? That having people understand their place in the world, that having better public art, might actually reduce some of the divisions we have in our society. Wouldn't that be incredibly valuable? This is, becomes very hard to justify a distinctive, you know, there might be an impact. And part of the linear model ideology that I want to like extract us out of is to be continually looking for that as a justification. It might happen, it might not. That shouldn't be why we fund it. Thank you so much for this talk. Oh. Um, <laughs>
I almost so, broke his computer. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so my question is like a historical one. It's a follow up, I think, from what Mike was asking. But um, mm. from this gang of Kuyami, Birchman, and so on, um, thinking about the public domain, uh, you, you said something really interesting. You said, like, you know, one implication that followed out of that was this idea of like good science being value free. Mm -hmm. But um, actually, going back to those debates, like they don't use the language of values; they use yep. the language of experience and subjectivity and so right. on. But I think it's even more malicious than that. It's not value. For, I mean, it's one thing to think that their debates inspired a whole public zeitgeist and then made us think that it's value, right? <laughs> but they themselves, like, were much more intentional about, like, no, they're the authorities of which values matter. And so it's a little bit more malicious than that than I think. Is getting presented here. I, I mm. just want to press you on that because I think they saw themselves as promoting the correct values, not using that language. Um, but they were kind of, you know, thinking about, for example, operationalism and so on. Like there are debates articulating that. Yeah. Okay. So you're probably right that I'm being nicer to them than they they deserve. Um, okay. So the the question is. Um, um, aren't I giving being a little too easy on the Polanyi Bridgman uh, Bush folks because they weren't just saying that science is value free; they were dictating what the right values were, right? Um, and part of it is lumping them together, which is a little bit artificial, but it, it, they're very distinct from the Kilgore, <laughs> Polanyi, um, Bernal, and the the Jewett view. Um, and one of the things that you could say about that is, look, uh, the Recent work, um, this hasn't yet been published, uh, really good work by a graduate student um, that I was reading for a journal, actually argued that this idea of the, the linear model and putting the money in for basic research um, actually, and pretending like that was value free, enabled capture of scientific research by military and commercial interests. Because of course it wasn't. And so that ended up driving the US scientific enterprise predominantly for the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st century. And we should be worried about that. So that's one sort of, and you might say like, no, 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 actually that was directly in line with what Bush was saying. But, you know, Polanyi is like, no, no, free play, free intellect. You know, that's, I'm not, I'm not gonna say what's gonna happen. Um, David wants to say that eventually we'll get good things, but, you know, I'm not gonna say what's gonna happen. So it depends on who's sort of you're looking at. Um, you also might think about the way in which the Cold War and sort of the nationalism of the Cold War solidified a particular view of what the right values were. And so um, people have argued that it's, you know, the sort of breakdown of that consensus in the 1960s that ultimately, that like is part of the causal story of why the social contract starts getting challenged, although not as a contract. Um, in the 70s. Uh, right. So you're right, it's complicated. All right. Let's try it. Matt. Oh. Hey, Matt. Hi there. Echo, echo, echo. A little feedback. Um, how you doing, Heather? Um, I so I wanted to ask about by Dole. Um, you mentioned it briefly, but my sense is that it's been one of the most transformative aspects of the science society relation. Um, over the last 40 years. And so I, I just, do you, have a, do you have any evaluation of it in the net? Has it been beneficial or detrimental um, in, its, in its effect on the, that science side of society relation? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, are you asking about data or are you asking just what I feel? Uh, well, I, you know, either one, whatever you've got. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I don't have good data. It has expanded contract research organizations and a technology, um, I'm sorry, not contract, technology transfer offices across universities. Um, most uh, empirical studies of these offices show that for most universities, they lose money because filing for patents is expensive and only occasionally do you hit a jackpot. Uh, Justin Biddle has done really good work trying to argue that even though um, it, it, if you survey scientists, they'll say like patent worries about patent infringement doesn't actually affect their research agenda. 
it's mostly because they're willing to infringe on each other's patents all the time. Um, so <laughs> that's not good because as soon as anyone starts enforcing patents, then you're going to have all kinds of upstream effects. And uh, he's actually looked at some cases where it really clearly has distorted what we are capable of knowing because research exemptions are extremely low. And even if you had research exemptions in some cases, it wouldn't cover things. Um, I think the arguments that having the ability to patent something that was publicly funded is dodgy, um, sort of structurally. Uh, you shouldn't be able to have private commercial interest created out of something that's publicly funded. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of, it's not clear to me that this has actually increased at all any sort of societal benefits. But again, we haven't been doing good examinations, empirical examinations of the impact societal benefits. So all I have is a gut feeling. That's pretty inadequate. It's like a prior. Do you want to be a Bayesian about it? <laughs> <laughs> Sandy. Thanks, Heather. That was great. I just have one question, like, which is, what's the social good? It strikes me that um, this, it seems in part that your account relies on um, articulating what the social goods are in order to then uh, run the rest of the story, rather than adopting some kind of procedural model of, of how those are determined. And because you, you know, you're dissing the of revolution, all those guys for having the wrong social good and sneaking them in, there has to be, again, especially in a climate where now all sorts of things that are normatively valuable in science are threatened in the social space, mm -hmm. there has to be some kind of procedural way of determining rather than specify, unless you're going to argue for these are the social goods and that's what we should do. And that's a different. Oh, no, no, I don't. I don't want to specify okay. uh, like a, a fixed set of social good. I think, I think Dewey is actually really important on this issue of what counts as a public good. Well, public and social, I think, are slightly different. Public uh, goods have a kind of economic analysis about things that can't be owned by anyone. Yeah, oh, so, so the Dewey and conception of public goods is a little different, right? For Dewey, a public, an, an issue becomes public, a public issue, as opposed to a private issue, if the impacts of a group of actors spill on significantly to those who are not deciding. And, and one of the things that science does is it actually tells us when that's happening. So it used to be, for example, that burning fossil fuels was largely a private matter. You could just, you know, if you wanted to heat your house with coal or oil, great, do it. It's your house, it's your decision. You buy it, you burn it, no problem. In the era of climate change, it suddenly it takes on a huge public valence because there's an impact that's been detected of an activity that goes beyond the individual who's deciding to do it. So that's Dewey's conception. And then that's the difference between public and private. What counts as a public good then further requires additional like empirical discussion and political discussion. Like what's the good that we're trying to actually. And so my view is that, you know, I don't think there's like one process. It's got to be dynamic. Science is involved in that discussion. That's actually one of the reasons why it's so important to have science as part of society is because it can inform these discussions in a really rich and important way. Um, I don't know if I like a good procedure for this other than politics. <laughs> yeah, I know everyone's like, oh no, not politics. But politics is the process of how we live together in a plural society. And one of the most important debates is what counts as public good? I don't see a way around it. All right. Let me try again. Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> hey, Heather. <laughs> I enjoyed the talk. And um, I was just curious to, um, you talked a lot about issues related to funding in terms of, you know, what this new social contract uh, might look like. Um, and no, no, we're, I just, we're not doing social contracts anymore. I know. I was going to sort of put that in quotation marks or something like okay. that. But whatever this relationship looks like. Um, and I just wanted to invite you to say anything more about other kinds of initiatives that might be part of this. Like I was thinking about things like open science, you know, you're, you've done all this good work on public engagement with science, you know, community engaged research, maybe reorganizing what 
university departments or organizations are like, you know, it seems like there are a lot of things that could be part of this new vision. And so I know that's a big question, but I just wanted to invite if you wanted to say anything about what you've been thinking about that. It's a huge question. It's why we're having the conference in April on institutions and the scientific research agenda, because it's way too big for me to tackle all of that. But uh, impediments to doing sort of participatory or community-based research within institutions is one of the really difficult issues. It's partly because academics are spatially mobile, partly because the reward structures aren't really well attuned to the kind of long-term trust building that you need to do to do this kind of research and do it well. Um, these are really hard questions. Um, and they're questions that, you know, will require some experimental institution building and um, evaluation. And I'm going to leave it at that. How about uh, private uh, funding? Uh, how we get we can bring these people to the table and as part of this new institution, especially given the fact that uh, private sector benefits a lot from, in, if not directly, then indirectly from public funding. Uh, an internet company, uh, best example is that they make billions and gazillions of dollars based on certain uh, research publicly funded years ago, like internet and yeah. stuff like that. So, and this is this has also a conceptual part because we have this somewhat more blurred distinction between private intellectual property and public intellectual property, if this term makes any sense. So if you could say a little bit more about how bring this private sector uh, to the table. Uh, just one remark, I have to do it, so. <laughs> you mentioned, you mentioned uh, digging in search for dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and this is really interesting because the history of this is just great because this was driven by very private ambitions yes. of people, mostly tourists. Carnegie people. versus Rockefeller, uh, right? Uh, That's a... These were funders, but there were also researchers ah. driven by their ambitions. I forgot the name. Two of them in the 19th century in the US, especially. So this is fascinating because we have pure science, I benefit from that, here and there, and driven by this ambition who, who is able to dig more and dig deeper. <laughs> fascinating story. Though. And, and driven by, so this is dinosaur bones, just for the audience, because I totally forgot to do the thing. Um, and it really was driven by private philanthropy. So, you know, Andrew, uh, not Andrew, Frank Dewitt saying, you know, we don't need public funding for the science because philanthropists will step up and do it. Um, you know, I was at Waterloo and it was private money that put together the Perimeter Institute. All right, so um, that is a real thing um, and can drive a lot of, you know, research that, uh, you know, scientists care about. Um, how to capture private funding for more public oriented projects is really tricky. There's a history of private public partnerships and some of them have gone really well and some of them have not. Um, and uh, there's, you know, worries about the capture of the agenda and bending science by partnering with private commercial interests. So you have to set things, these, these things up really carefully. Um, and one of the main problems with private funding is not, you can set it up really carefully from the start and make sure that you, uh, the, the research doesn't get too captured by the private interests. But if institutionally, you wanna keep going back to the same well, then the interests end up predominating. So it's more the desire for the second grant that can really distort the research than the first grant necessarily. Um, and that's a big worry for institutions that want money to do research, right? So tread with caution. 
provide any, uh, with apologies for those who were on the, on the list. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. <laughs> Uh, next week. Uh, my question is actually. Uh,